the great British countryside, setting for one of the most pivotal battles of the Second World War. Churchill called it the front line of freedom. And it was fought by the farmers of Britain. It was the battle to feed a nation. Over the course of a year, archaeologists Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn and historian Ruth Goodman worked Manor Farm in Hampshire, as it would have been during the Second World War. Now, Ruth and Peter are returning to Manor Farm to recreate the conditions of Christmas 1944, the sixth of the war. A bit of fun at Christmas. This time, they're without Alex, so they'll have their work cut out. With shortages biting deeper than ever, the southeast of England was in the grip of the worst bombing campaign since the Blitz of 1940. Ruth and Peter are about to discover how the countryside came to the aid of people living in cities in their hour of need. They provided food. Real country Christmas for the townspeople, this, isn't it? Drink. We've got a magical Christmas brew. And gifts to lift the spirits. Happy Christmas. This is the untold story of the wartime farm at Christmas. In 1939, at the outbreak of war, the government set farmers strict targets to double homegrown food production by 1944. They grew an additional six and a half million acres of crops, an area the size of Wales. But by December 1944, farmers faced a new challenge. Five years of fighting had devastated farmland and transport across Europe. Food was becoming scarce. The government demanded an extra 700,000 acres of pasture to be ploughed up. Farmers were fighting a battle to grow crops on unsuitable land that was prone to flooding. Hedging and ditching are really winter jobs, especially around here where we have such trouble with drainage. <laughs> Keeping the ditches open and clear is vital to the productivity of the land. There's a whole network of ditches here, around all the fields, all kind of carry the water. So the plan is to make all this water drain out into the river just that much faster, rather than sitting in the land. In wartime Britain, there were no machines that you could really turn to for this. It still had to be done traditionally in the old hand way with people and spades and rakes and bill hooks. <laughs> You can start to see this water flowing already, which just proves how blocked up this ditch was. Undertaking hard physical work on a rationed wartime diet was particularly challenging. Pies! I've got your pies! Come and get them! Well deserved. So the Ministry of Food set up the Rural Pie Scheme to fill the stomachs of hard-working farm labourers. Go on, dig in. Pies, pies, pies. Professor Karen Sayer has researched how the scheme worked. By 1944, it was distributing over a million pies a week. Can you imagine the logistical effort involved there? Yeah. And it runs from 1941 through beyond the war. So they're keeping people going. And this was all part of the attempt to provide more calories for those involved in heavy physical labour. Oh, absolutely. Literally feed them, take pies. And it really did mean that women in uniform turned up in fields carrying trays of pies. It really <laughs> did, yes, exactly. <laughs> I just love it. It's so British, isn't it, you know? Hey, we haven't got enough food. I know what we'll do. We'll have a national pie scheme. <laughs> the pies were distributed by one of the most important organisations of the Second World War the Women's Voluntary Service. Founded in 1938 by Stella Isaacs, Marchioness of Reading, at its peak, the WVS had over a million members. 
often older middle-class ladies, they did whatever they could to support the war effort. Christmas 1944 saw them called into action in cities, helping families who had lost everything in the bombing. They fed them, found them accommodation, clothing, and even toys for children. So by 44, the women and the voluntary services in the cities are stretched to the absolute maximum, and they're getting really punch drunk, and they're having to call on the women in the countryside through the WVS to come in and help them. So somebody like me, then, who'd spent the rest of the war out in the countryside, might not have been particularly comfortable in town, maybe. No. Um, suddenly finds themselves yeah. helping people who've been struggling on for years, yes. side by side. You know, having had this yes. great movement of townspeople out yeah. into the countryside, there's the beginning also of a movement of country people moving back into the yeah. towns to, to give help. offer real practical help for people who by this point are in considerable distress, who are absolutely worn down and at their wit's end. They deal with everything and they just try to make everybody's life a little bit better. In 1944, London was under threat from terrifying new Nazi weapons, the V-bombs. First came the V-1s, known as doodlebugs, unmanned flying bombs, difficult to detect by radar. When they reached their target, the engine cut, putting the bomb into a deadly dive. At their peak, more than 100 doodlebugs a day were hitting London, causing almost 23,000 casualties. Christine White lived in London as a small child and remembers the devastation they caused. The doodlebug is like, oh, I hated that sound. And, you know, you could see him. I mean, I can remember watching one once, you know, just watching this thing going over it, and suddenly it stopped. My mum, I was out on the street, my mum came hairing out, dragged me in and said, get in, you know. At one point, my school was bombed, but luckily they got all the children into the shelters and things like that. In September 1944, the Nazis unleashed a new, even more terrifying weapon, the V-2 rocket. At least 500 hit London, killing some 9,000 civilians. Travelling at over 3,000 miles per hour, they seemingly appeared from nowhere bringing terror and loss of life wherever they fell. Many also had to cope with the loss of family and friends on the battlefield. By Christmas 1944, hundreds of thousands of British servicemen and women had been killed. For Christine, this was to be the first Christmas without her father. He had been killed six months earlier during the D-Day landings. I presume your mother heard fairly quickly. Um... Yes, I mean, it's, it's odd because I remember she was running down the road with this paper in her hand and I'm thinking, what's going on? You know, and she was obviously very upset. It must have been a telegram, I presume. But they didn't tell children that someone had died in those days because you just suddenly wonder, well, why isn't Daddy around? You know, why is he not home? Christine still treasures the letters her father sent to her before he died. A crumb of comfort as the bombs rained down and Christmas approached. Is he from your father? Yes, he's from my dad. Oh. And he's saying things like, look after mummy for me and... Hope talking... you learn all your ABC by the yes. time I come home. Yes. Tell mummy I love you both. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Loads of love, daddy. Yeah. Christmas 44 must have been a pretty grim Christmas for you, then. I, I, yes, I mean, I don't remember much about it at all, so it must have been very much a, a non-event, you know. Mm. To protect people from bombing, in 1939, the government issued over one and a half million domestic air raid shelters. Although they offered some protection, their shortcomings were quickly exposed. Lots of people during the war really after that initial enthusiasm for Anderson shelters, found them less than ideal. For a start, they tended to flood any heavy rain and you could find yourself more than ankle deep in water. 
And then there was also the problem of just how secure they were. There were awful stories of people who were buried alive inside their Anderson shelters, and that put a lot of people off using them. So increasingly, they became rather abandoned. And like me, people started using them more for storage than anything else. By Christmas 1944, many had been abandoned. London, by far the most populated city in Britain, took the brunt of the attacks. So people there sought out deeper communal air raid shelters where they decamped, sometimes for weeks on end. It fell to organizations like the Women's Institute, Red Cross, Salvation Army, and Women's Voluntary Service to provide relief, especially at Christmas. I was talking to Karen about the WVS, you know, and they were talking so much about what that group and other groups were doing for people in emergency situations. And I was sort of wondering if we ought to do our bit. Well, definitely. I mean, the countryside, you've got that access to ingredients, haven't you? We might not have very many of the traditional Christmas ingredients, but we have got plenty of food here, one way or another. It's good food, it's fresh food, it's food that's going to lift people's spirits. And this is the one day of the year when I suppose everyone just wants to forget there's a war on yeah. and just celebrate life. We want to do something for the children, though, as well, like, really. Yeah, sort of form of distraction, toys or something yeah. of that ilk, games. Yeah. I mean, there wouldn't have been much in the shops in 1944 to buy a child. You would have to have made it. This is the thing. You don't buy Christmas, you make Christmas. Christmas isn't about what you can buy in shops. Christmas is about the people you gather around you and what you do with your time. Yeah. Well, that is the truth, isn't it? Everything else can go. Until now, it had been the role of the countryside to grow food for the nation and to take in evacuees from the cities. By 1944, with many London streets reduced to rubble and services at breaking point, the country people headed for the city to help. The government recognised that one thing in particular was vital to keeping up British morale, beer. They instructed it should never be rationed, and during the war, production rose by a third. Churchill demanded all frontline troops should receive four pints a week. And women factory workers were encouraged to drink beer for the first time, becoming known as the Pint Pot Girls. The main ingredient of beer is malting barley, and before the war, nearly 40% was grown abroad. The war cut off imports, so brewers were forced to water down their beer to meet demand. By 1944, shortages became so acute that the Ministry of Food urged brewers to experiment with alternative ingredients. Peter's going to make his own beer a morale booster for those forced to spend Christmas underground. He's calling on expert in rural crafts, Colin Richards, for help. As you can see, it's sort of dark, it's damp, and nobody knows where they are. During the war, it was imperative that nothing went to waste. So when the Ministry of Food got wind of a surplus of potatoes, they suggested they should be used to make beer. Colin's surplus is stored in a tunnel. Was it common to keep potatoes underground in the war? Well, the Ministry of Supply uh, requisitioned a lot of underground workings for the storage of sort of military goods, particularly sort of ammunition, torpedoes, etc. But for sort of farms and farmers in the rural areas that had old mine workings, you know, it, it was an opportunity to keep things safe, and not just for themselves, but for other villagers and for whole communities, so that if there was an incident, you know, if there were bombs or if there were, um, you know, the smashing of services, you know, sewers, water, then the food wouldn't be lost. The first stage in making the beer is to crush the potatoes, a job that calls for a bit of improvisation. And Colin's coal-powered ambulance. Henry and I have been given our instructions by Colin. Potato beer sounds a bit strange. Apparently makes you fart. We've been told 
wash the potatoes, which we've done. Bag the potatoes in small sacks, which we've done. And lay the potatoes out on this metal track, which we're doing. Because basically, these potatoes have to be somehow broken up so we can release the starches and the sugars to make our warts, which forms the basis for our beer. And Colin has got an idea along those lines. That's exactly what we want, really, isn't it? Absolutely perfect. We've crushed it enough to expose the inner surface of the potato, but not so much that it's just going to turn into one big stodgy mass. Rationing and shortages made celebrating Christmas a challenge. Despite this, the women's voluntary service tried to make it as normal as possible for displaced families. Magazines published ideas on creating make-do-and-mend decorations. Lanterns from any bit of coloured paper. I got a bit of old wallpaper I found at the back. Karen's getting tips from the 1944 Land Girls newsletter on using the papery covering around the fruit of the physalis plant, commonly known as Chinese lanterns. During the war, they were a garden favourite. Here's a letter to the editor. It says, I would like to suggest the use of Chinese lanterns, which are these, uh, for Christmas decorations. Strip the lantern from the stalk of the plant and thread cotton through the stalks of the lanterns. They look very nice hung around pictures <laughs> or make a bright splash of colour strung across a room as paper chains used to be strung. And in fact, they're absolutely right. It's making the most beautiful Christmas decoration. Look at this. That is going to be gorgeous, and it is very colourful. But you can imagine in families that have been bombed out, that have been, that have suffered all sorts of trauma, if they could have salvaged something like this that's part of the family, in a sense, it would help them to remember that, and it would mm. help them to remember perhaps lost family members that mm. are no longer with them. So I think it's something that becomes very powerful, actually. Christmas trees were scarce, as wood was taken by the war effort. Tight controls on the use of paper meant decorations were reused year after year. And with the fall of the Far Eastern rubber plantations to the Japanese, balloons were scarce. But the enemy inadvertently dropped an ideal Christmas decoration from the sky, strips of metal foil called chaff. Well, this was dropped by enemy planes to confuse the radar, to make it look like a huge force was coming over um, to right, draw so out a, a the resources of the Right, so a single German plane force. would come over, chuck this, chuck this stuff out. Yeah. We, looking at our radar screens, would think, oh, my goodness, there's a huge squadron yes, coming. Exactly. We'd scramble everybody, they'd all yeah. go up in the air, and yeah. there'd be nothing. Yeah. So you pick this up out of the fields, fields. and there's kind of one in the eye for the Germans. Right, I'm now going to turn this into a Christmas decoration. <laughs> you think this is a, a force where evil It's not, it's a Christmas decoration. So I suppose these sort of things, you know, they're just sort of to cheer people up, aren't they, really? A bit of fun at Christmas, something a bit different. Some sort of feeling of a special day. You can't do it by buying loads of stuff. You can't do it by giant, expensive presents. You can't do it by overindulging in posh food. You've yeah. got to do it somehow, haven't exactly. you? And using any resource that you have to hand. In the spirit of wartime improvisation, Colin, too, is using any resources he has to hand to build a makeshift Christmas brewery. Right, this is uh, our sort of mash tun, I suppose. We're going to pop the potatoes in here, pop some water in here, and it will gently heat, but it won't boil, and that will hopefully bring out the starches and the sugars. Stick some water in the bottom first. This sugar starch solution, known as wort, will form the basis of the beer. Time for the tassies. Oh, they're nicely crushed. I've got confidence, Colin. How about you? I think so, because... Uh... You know, everything you need to make beer, we've got here. We've got sort of heat, we get the potatoes. So everything else is down to nature, really. 
I like the fact you class potatoes as something you need to make beer. And I suppose in 1943, with shortages in 1944, it kind of was. You know, keeping morale up, and particularly at Christmas, you know, it was very important. There's a lot on our shoulders, isn't there? There will be if you drop that. Right, I suppose we just need to fill this up with water now. It wasn't just ingredients for the beer that were in short supply. Containers to put the beer in were becoming increasingly scarce by 1944. I've just been hunting around the farm for a container to put our beer in, and the obvious choice is a barrel, and they are beautiful pieces of craftsmanship, and they are built to last, but sadly, because it's an organic material, they don't. I mean, that's... that's dry rot. This is pretty much useless. I mean, back in the day, we could have just fixed this, but during the war, you can't get hold of this oak, because although we've got oak in Britain, it's the wrong type of oak. I know it sounds absurd, but it's all, it's all knotty and gnarly and it's tough to work. And this stuff was coming from the Baltics, but that is completely cut off. So, we're going to have to be slightly inventive about where we get a container for our beer. And it is quite critical, because beer, it will condition in its container. Wartime brewers turn to an ancient alternative using a raw material Britain still had in abundance, clay. Peter's calling on the services of potter Mike Fletcher to make some wartime beer flagons. So I suppose during the war, pottery wasn't a reserved occupation, so all those young potters that have been training up, they've... Would go off. They've gone they've off. They've gone off. So and I suppose uh, the, old, the old boys are And left fight. people like myself. <laughs> <laughs> They're too old to fight, but still can pot throw yeah. have left behind. So we're extremely busy. Well, the next stage, Peter, is we open the clay open. And then I can then start squeezing from the bottom. And then you start pulling the clay up. Yeah. This flagon will hold a gallon. But during the war, even bigger stoneware containers were made to hold nine gallons. So big, they had to be reinforced with iron rings. You make it look so easy. And then just make the neck like so. In 1944, the V weapons destroyed thousands of homes in London, leaving many children not just homeless, but without any possessions. Many had never known a peacetime Christmas. The Women's Voluntary Service recognised the importance of toys in distracting children from the horror that surrounded them and began a drive for makeshift Christmas presents. Second World War expert Biff Ravenhill has come to help Ruth turn household waste into doll's house furniture. It's all just rubbish, really, isn't it? The sort of things that most people would throw out in the modern world. Mm. <laughs> just sort of finding a new life and a use. Tiny little bits and bobs. Yes. Making toys from junk had been a popular pastime before the war. And this 1930s book, Practical Suggestions in Toy Making, is full of ideas for children. But now in wartime, it became a necessity. Yeah, I mean, nowadays there is a sort of doll's house industry and, and people mm. can buy ready-made bits and bobs, but doll's houses were really do-it-yourself, weren't they, during mm. the war? Now, I found this, and <laughs> this is a Christmas 1943, and, of course, there were lots of articles in here. I mean, it looks so modern, doesn't it's it? It's wonderful. Let the um, doll's house go modern. go modern. I love it. And it's basically made out of wire and bits of canvas, and it's just bent round. Yeah. Just a few yards of flexible wire, a bit of gummed paper tape, the sort pasted onto windows during the Blitz, and a fragment of material from the piece box can be converted into an enchanting set of furniture for the dolls. And of course, during the war, all resources were so precious and every single bit of everything was saved and scavenged. And of course, things like these cigarette packets. So many people smoked that there would have been tons of these around. Mm. And the same with matchboxes, of course. I mean, that's all been made out of matchboxes. 
And then cigarette cards I noticed as well, which I yes. used to collect at the time. Well, these you? make super pictures for a bedroom wall or a sitting room wall yeah. because, again, you can They're use about matchsticks. They're the right scale, aren't they, yep. to make little frames. To make tiny frames. Now, you're making a little bedspread, aren't you? Yeah, to I am. Top. I've made a pillow. <laughs> It's That's a gingham kind of doll's house, it is, isn't it? It is a bit, yes. There we go. And then you'll cover it on the top. Look, <laughs> <laughs> no, a little bed. <laughs> Here's the truth. Let's go for it. The beer flagon has dried. Now it must be glazed to make it watertight. And there it is. And there it is, glazed. What exactly is a glaze? A glaze is glass. It's sealing the pot. So there's tiny, tiny particles of glass in here? Really, at the end yeah. of the day, yes, because it's the same yeah. recipe as glass. The neck is also glazed, traditionally a darker shade. We've added red iron oxide and 2% and 2% manganese oxide, and that will give it that lovely honey yeah. coloured. Take it like that. It's heavier than you think. Nice again. and level. So look at the top, top, yeah, and that. And you want to go about an inch past the shoulder. Here we go. Go on, down, down, That's about down, an inch. and then up. Fantastic. One glazed pot. The pot must be fired at 1300 degrees Celsius. So Colin is rigging up a makeshift kiln. Pete, here we are, Colin. Wow. What do you think? Have you made that? <laughs> I'd like to say I did, but I didn't. Ah, right. To reach this temperature, they're using a highly combustible fuel brought to Britain during the Second World War by American troops. Propane. Whoa! Propane gas such as this was discovered in 1910. Uh, it is a byproduct of the refining process of making petrol. And it, it was very, very big in America. And it was essentially introduced to the UK when the troops came across, because uh, we basically had town gas that so was produced by coal. And after the Second World War, propane gas had its golden age. It became a major fuel source, not only in America, but also this country as well. Anyway, we should get a lid on this. Yes. Well, it's not just a lid. Um, you've wanted to get as much benefit out of this gas that's going in. Mm. So I thought what we could do is actually create another chamber where we could put resinous pine and try and extract some pitch and some oil out of the pine. During the war, fuel was precious and wasn't to be wasted. So in true wartime spirit, Colin is also using the kiln's heat to make pine oil. When pine wood is heated to around 300 degrees Celsius, oil is released and can be used as a lubricant or to protect wood and metal from corrosion. A great resource to have around a wartime farm. In the areas where there were a lot of pine forests, you would do this on a colossal scale, really. With the pine oil and the pot cooking away, the beer is flavoured with hops and the fermenting of sugar in the potatoes into alcohol is begun with yeast. Producing beer and gifts would go a long way to bring Christmas cheer to those under attack in cities. But people also looked for comfort and hope from another, more spiritual source. Places of worship had a vital role to play, especially at Christmas. St Bartholomew's Church is where workers at Manor Farm have prayed for centuries. This is the sixth Christmas of the war, and much has changed since peacetime. Many of our loved ones are still far from home and will again not be joining us this Christmas. The danger of invasion has now passed, and with quiet confidence, we can see the end in sight. Before the war, religion had been declining in popularity. But by Christmas 1944, there had been a marked change. The church had quite a special place in wartime Britain for many people. It was 
a source of great comfort and strength. But then there were other people who found that the war turned them right off religion. And you notice that the numbers of people going to church begin to fall very rapidly after the Second World War. It was a time when people went one way or the other, a sort of polarization when some turned to the church with more fervor perhaps than they'd had before, and others turned away. was looking to the church for a binding together of the community of all people. And this was happening, well, right across the whole of the Western world. Stalin, <laughs> amazingly in Russia, you know, having banned religion, actually re-encouraged Christianity during the war, hoping for this effect amongst the Russian population before once again banning religion afterwards. And our government thought that the church could offer something that bound the British people together. It wasn't just the British people that church bound together. By Christmas 1944, one in five farm workers were German or Italian prisoners of war, as Godfrey White recalls. He became friends with two Germans stationed nearby. Do you remember prisoners of war? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. We, um, I know two by name. Frank Schoen, yeah. who's died now, but George Gabara, he's still alive. They both married yeah. ladies from, yeah. from the area. Some were accepted by the local church, and there are accounts of them singing carols to the congregation in German. Do you know how they were sort of regarded by the wider community? There was a little bit of not quite... Everything didn't go yeah. quite smoothly. But the ones that I knew were very good. You know, got mm. on very well with them. I suppose it's very easy to always think of the Germans as Nazis, but... Oh, yeah. mm -mm. Uh, Frank Schoen, he was in the Waffen-SS. Right. He was in the Hitler Youth yeah. and was forced into it, if you like, right. rather than volunteer. Yeah, so it was a sort of... You had to. Yeah. yeah. Both uh, Frank and, as I say, um, George Gabara both involved themselves with the church at Botley. Mm. So the church is very much a, a centre of the community. Very much a centre of the community, yeah. yeah. Mm. Especially at a time like this at Christmas, and you can put your differences aside. After six hours of brewing, Peter's come to see how the potato beer is coming along. Should we give it a go? Right. <coughs> Almost looks like beer. It does. <coughs> yes, smells good. It does, doesn't it? It's very hoppy, and it's quite sweet, yeah. and it's very hot. Actually, it's very nice. <laughs> it's lovely. It well, is. I'd, I'd certainly, you know, welcome this type of beer. Yeah. So our little clay pot for our beer is cooking away in the kiln. The oil's coming out. And it almost tastes like we've got a magical Christmas brew. It certainly does. Working for the war effort came in addition to the day-to-day -day duties of running the farm, 365 days a year, even Christmas Day. Let's wash her udders off first. Let's make sure she's reasonably clean so that nothing gets into the milk. 
But unlike those living in cities, country people didn't have to survive purely on rations. Our cows really represent one of the major differences between life and food, particularly for country dwellers, to those who were living in the towns. All the milk officially from all of our cows goes into the central rationing system, prioritizing mothers and babies in particular. But as an incentive, farmers were allowed to take as much milk as they wanted from their cows for personal use. So there's no shortage on milk, butter and cream for us. Peter's also busy on the farm, heating the pine wood on the kiln as extracted oil. That's quite nice. It is. He's using it to weatherproof farm tools. I can't believe that we managed to get so much oil and such great oil out of so little wood. Fantastic. Ruth and Peter are going to leave the countryside and head to London to bring some Christmas cheer, as many farmers did in 1944. They've made improvised presents for children. And created makeshift decorations to brighten up underground air raid shelters. The clay flagons are fired and filled with morale-boosting potato beer. Communal feeding was also important to keep spirits up, a job undertaken by the Women's Voluntary Service. In London, Ruth's going to help cook a WVS-style Christmas feast. By the sixth Christmas of the war, food rationing was more severe than ever. Traditional fare was not an option, so they had to find alternatives. Yet at times, there were huge surpluses of vegetables. This was thanks to the government's Dig for Victory campaign. Nothing went to waste in wartime, so Ruth's kept a surplus of carrots in the Anderson shelter for Christmas. Boy, have I got a lot of carrots. <sighs> At least we got something for Christmas. Go on. Let me have that one. Oh, right, down. Well, I think this beer is really going to boost morale. Colin's coal-powered ambulance is only capable of travelling short distances. So Ruth and Peter are taking the train to London. Unlike petrol, which was in short supply, coal was a fuel that Britain had in abundance. Before the war, the railways had employed over 500,000 men. But with 100,000 of them called up to fight, like so many other roles in wartime, their shoes were filled by women. <laughs> They're really struggling with those couplings, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's amazing during the war. You get women doing absolutely everything on the railways, really all the heavy work, except for driving trains. I mean, it's the only thing that they didn't draft women in for. It takes so long to train an engine driver that that remained with the male yeah. workers who had the experience. Women yeah. doing the shunting, women doing the portering, women in the booking lodges, women in the signal boxes. Women losing fingers. Women losing fingers. With rail travel the only viable option over long distances, by 1944, passenger numbers had doubled. Getting a seat was a luxury. Troops and war-related freight took priority, so journeys were often delayed and sometimes painfully slow. We're 
lucky to be able to go on a train, really, aren't we? I mean, when you think how much pressure the railways were under mm. during this period of the war, they're moving all the munitions, they're moving all the troops around the place, yeah. they're trying to do such a large proportion of the freight to get it off the roads, yeah. to keep the roads free. <laughs> you get this huge pressure. They're running extra trains, but they're also busily saying, is your journey necessary? Is our journey necessary? Yes, of course it's necessary. Yeah, important war work, Ruth. You know. <laughs> I'm going to go and have a look at the GPO. You know the mail. Yeah. <laughs> See you in a bit. During the war, the Royal Mail was entirely dependent on the railways to move post around the country. On top of the surge in passenger traffic, there were some 350 million items of post to move at Christmas. With families split apart by war, more Christmas cards than ever were sent. Ruth is meeting post office historian Cyril Parsons to see how it coped. Hello. <laughs> I love this. This is such an iconic image to travel in post office sort of thing. I mean, did they keep running right throughout the war? No, the actual sorting of letters on the train ceased in about the middle of 1940, and the reckoning is that the service was curtailed because the trains were, were disrupted by bombing and so forth. The trains had to be rerouted. And of course, travelling post offices had previously run to very, very strict timetables over strict routes. But of course, the trains were still vital for actually carrying the letters. <laughs> but all the extra mail to and from those in the armed forces was bulky. So the post office came up with an ingenious solution the air graph. To save space, letters were miniaturized into microfilm, flown to their destination, then blown up and printed at the other end. Quite early in the war, the proposal came to photograph the letters, which were written on standard forms, and you could perhaps have 1,500 letters on one roll of film, taking up far, far less space. So you get something sort of that size That's right. in the aeropelling, yeah. yeah. flying across, arriving in a post office in Britain, yeah. and then somebody has to sort of open the film and, and develop it, and each frame then becomes, becomes a, letter. a letter that goes through the standard That's mail. That's right. These are just incredible, aren't they? This is a really lovely one. Dear Dad, just to wish you a happy Christmas, and may all your wishes for the new year come true. Your loving son, Eric. And at the bottom, here's hoping. And this busy system creaking at the seams, how much more important at Christmas than at any other time? I mean, keeping these communication lines open must have been, well, just so emotionally important to people. The Lord Nelson locomotive, built in 1926, actually worked on these routes during the war. Yeah. Up, up, come. Thank you. The task of running an overloaded and overstretched rail system 24 hours a day, seven days a week, was made even more difficult at night by the blackout. Fireman Bob Cartwright joined the railways 50 years ago and was trained by drivers who worked through the war. You can imagine at night, the glare from the firebox on one of these engines was considerable, and there was a danger of enemy aircraft seeing that. So the whole cab was sheeted in. There would have been a sheet from the top of the cab back to those irons there, yeah. and anything stopped light showing where you So you couldn't really see where you were going, and apart from the little bit of night vision that you had. Yeah. Um, and of course, one of these engines actually ran into a bomb crater at St. Denis during the war. Just sort of it just went straight in. But I suppose all that extra pressure during the war, all those extra journeys, must have had quite a toll. There was, but you shared the work, you know. Right. Um, and, and there was a tremendous camaraderie. You'd yeah. help one another out, and you'd look after one another. Um, it, it's a very old-fashioned system, and one, unfortunately, has sort of died a death with modern thinking in the modern world. Peter and Ruth are heading to Chislehurst, southeast of London, just 10 miles from the city centre. Thank you. Oh, 
was lovely and rainy again. Oh, it's Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> We're lucky it ain't snowing. <laughs> 100 feet below ground is one of London's largest wartime air raid shelters. Chislehurst Caves are made up of 22 miles of tunnels, dug by hand between the 13th and 19th centuries to extract chalk and flint to build London. In 1944, the Women's Voluntary Service, along with the Red Cross and the Salvation Army, were here to offer food and support to those sheltering from V2 rockets. Today, Jim Gardner owns the caves, and his father was a warden here during the war. Hello, Peter. Good to meet How you. How are you? Very well, thank you. Well, welcome to Chittlehurst Caves. So what was it like down here in Christmas 1944? Packed. It really? was probably at the height of its use. Uh, the V2s were coming down like rain. Um, there were 15,000 people down here at the busiest times. Um, from all over South London, uh, North Kent, living down here, sheltering from the bombs. One or two bombs landed right above us and uh, they didn't hear a thing down here. 15,000 people living in the caves warmed the air temperature by 10 degrees centigrade. And after the war, it took a whole year to cool down again. The sign here says that they were selling tickets sixpence a week to shelter down here, and that covered the cost of the sanitary works that they had to do. Because if you imagine several thousand people in a cave, um, come morning, there's a bit of stuff to move. And I suppose since you couldn't hear the bombs down here, you could actually get a silent night at Christmas. Uh, yes, apart from 15,000 people breathing and sighing and, uh, and snoring, <laughs> yes, it was a very peaceful night. Come on, Henry. Cooking food in the caves would have burnt too much oxygen, so the women's voluntary service prepared meals above ground. So the WVS actually initially just set up sort of tea, and tea wagons outside right. such places so the people geniuses yeah <laughs> so the people couldn't at least go and get a hot cup of tea yeah. and then gradually that involves into organizing more food and particularly at christmas with turkey scarce stuffed rabbit was a wartime substitute we got loads of rabbit meat it's going to be a real country christmas for the townspeople this isn't it We've got to do enough stuffing for eight bunnies that's made out of parsley and celery, which is out of this cool little magazine. The Ministry of Food produced a booklet in 1944 to help cook a Christmas meal using non-rationed ingredients. They estimated that only one family in ten would get turkey or goose for their Christmas dinner, but a stuffed baked rabbit made a tasty alternative. It doesn't do any harm to have loads of stuff in there because those rabbits have got to go between everybody. Chances are that many of the people that we are feeding, being townies, are not used to eating rabbit, whereas, you know, country people are always eat rabbit. Yeah. Um, and there was also a sort of social snobbishness about it as a meat before the war. Rabbit was a meat of the poorer country sort, you know, yeah. and that other people didn't touch it, and they sort of slightly snobby and sneered at it. Of course, as the war goes on, <laughs> suddenly it's all they can it starts afford. to look yeah. a lot more attractive. <laughs> and you find that townspeople begin keeping rabbits for rabbits meat in eat. their backyards, yeah. whereas originally it had only been country people who did that. Yeah. You know, you sort of see it moving through society. Rabbit became really popular for a while. And only, it's a real shame, really, that since the war it's disappeared from the modern British diet, because it is nice. Underground in Chislehurst Caves, Peter's seeing how the 15,000 Londoners were accommodated, sometimes for weeks on end. So, did people live just wherever they wanted? Well, they were uh, assigned an area. For instance, this is where it all started. You can see the number on the wall, A1. They thought that A1 down to A29, three or four beds, bunks underneath each number, that would probably be enough. But from then on, it just grew and grew. They were into the X, Ys and Zs in the end. So there is quite a lot of infrastructure down here. Oh, yes, by 1944, the government had spent the money. They had put in all mod cons and it became an underground town. 
and people live down here for weeks, possibly months at a time. Their homes in London had been bombed out, they had nowhere to go, and this was warm, not particularly comfortable, but it was safe, um, and everything was provided. There was an underground cinema, chapel, citizens' advice bureau, even a hospital. Set up as a full-time facility. Um, it had a doctor and two nurses on call every day. Yeah. Did you get any births down here? One. <laughs> One that we know of. And they named her Cavina <laughs> to celebrate the fact she'd been born in a cave, not something I think she overly appreciated in later life. By Christmas 1944, most of the ingredients needed to cook Christmas dinner were severely rationed. So Ruth's making a wartime version of candied orange, candied carrot. Candying carrots is really easy, like candying peel. You don't have to be that delicate with it. If you try and candy whole soft fruit, you, it's a really yeah, long, slow a, process yeah, and, and really it can careful go wrong it. very easily. But carrots and orange peel you can do in a day. So you sort of need something that's got a little bit of structural integrity to it. Yeah. And then you boil them very briefly, really, in a sugar syrup. The WVS actually got an additional sugar ration for this sort of work, which would have helped. Rationing called for culinary innovation. Some made their cooking fat go further by mixing paraffin with it, while ground dried beans mixed with almond essence replaced marzipan. It looks much more like orange peel, doesn't it, out of marmalade mm. now? To bulk out the meagre rationed ingredients, Ruth's making the most of the carrot glut. There will be boiled carrots to accompany the rabbit, carrot soup, carrot cake, and carrot fudge made with grated carrot in gelatine. This is just such an odd recipe. I think it's another one of these wartime things in which they're trying to sort of mimic familiar foods. You know, you can't mm. make fudge, you can't afford fudge because it's made entirely of fat and sugar. So how do you make something that gives people a, a feeling of fudge, even though there's next to no fat and next to no sugar. A goodly handful of grated carrots. And then that's my orange essence. Another handful of grated carrot. So I just need to turn it into a basin or a tray and let it set. Christmas Day, traditionally a time of peace and goodwill to all mankind. But in wartime, celebrating Christmas was an act of defiance in the face of death, bomb damage and constant shortages. In 1944, the population of Britain was more determined than ever to create festive spirit against all odds. On Christmas Day itself, the bombing stopped. The 15,000 people sheltering in Chislehurst Caves weren't to know this, so it would be another day spent underground. The food prepared by the Women's Voluntary Service is ready, and Ruth's joined by Peter, who's brought along his potato beer. <laughs> careful this beer <laughs> makes you very gassy <laughs> and we are in cave so have a taste it tastes all right it just smells horrific it smells more like cider that's what it is it yeah. smells more like really scrumpy cider food was recognized as vital to maintaining the health and morale of those in emergency situations once again, notice, but here's the WVS making the most of things, jumping in when there's an emergency. Yeah. For ordinary circumstances. Would you like some rabbit? Certainly would, thank you very much. Keeping morale up in these sort of conditions is really important, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to ward off the cold and mm. cope with the dark, you've got to have something that just sort of gives you a G up every now and again. 
But, I mean, you know, we've created a Christmas out of... Out of next to nothing. Well, also out of um, <laughs> a surplus stock. So, surplus potatoes to make this beer and surplus <laughs> carrots to make everything carroty. <laughs> Which is pretty much everything down here. <laughs> it's a very carrot-themed meal. You've got shredded carrot, you've got boiled carrot. Carrot cake, you know, carrot fudge. Candy carrots. You can have it yourself, that's you. it. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. You'd definitely like some beer. <laughs> Tastes better than it smells. <laughs> With so many sheltering underground, there was no communal eating area, so people simply ate by their beds. Those who had lost everything to bombing also needed clothing and bedding. And again, the WVS came to the rescue. I've got another blanket here for you. Can I just tuck it on the bed at the back there? You're going to need that later, aren't you? Right, stick the blindfold on. Even children's games took on a wartime theme. None more popular than pin the moustache on Hitler. Right, here you go. In your hand. You good with that? You can feel the pin? Yeah. You're going to stick that on Hitler, but first, these guys are going to spin you around. Oh, no. Can't. <laughs> Historian doctor John Martin is an expert on wartime farming. In the direction. Is, it, is this quite a common thing in the war? Variations of games like this were very common in the war, particularly encouraged by the government to reinforce the idea who the evil people were. <laughs> Good effort. Well <laughs> it was propaganda designed to particularly in terms of humiliating a figure who was actually sending over V-rockets, particularly in the latter stages of the war, which were completely indiscriminate. So I suppose poke fun of them? Yeah, poke, I think that's very important, to poke fun of them. Well done. That's pretty good. The Salvation Army, too, specialised in disaster relief, providing spiritual support, basic comforts and, of course, music. At Christmas 1944, they played here in the caves. I know it's, it's a strange mix, isn't it? It's a, yeah. a lovely, jovial party atmosphere, especially in such a confined space, but thinking about what must have been going on up there. I have to say, the whole of this exploring, the, the wartime thing, I find myself with deeply mixed emotions. There's a bit of me that feels full of patriotic pride, and there's a bit of me that is in awe of people mm. who somehow found the courage and the energy to go through it. On Boxing Day, at 20 past nine in the evening, the bombing of London resumed, with a V2 hitting a pub in Islington, killing 68 people. It would be eight more long months before the war would finally be over. Christmas 1944 would be the last of the Second World War. Well, here's to make doing and mending. Here's to make doing and mending. Here's to a peaceful future. Yes. And may there never have to be another Christmas underground. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas.